the title is Beyond Chiari Malformation because this is a follow-up on a <clears throat> previous presentation I was able to make uh, looking at conditions that exist in a comorbid scenario with Chiari malformation. And these two conditions I listed are probably the most common reason we'll hear a patient didn't do well after a Chiari surgery for us is a frame and magnum decompression and cranioplasty. At our hospital, to avoid being in this circumstance, we go to great lengths to have a comprehensive diagnostic plan, something that was initiated following uh, attending these conferences and learning more about what can be missed and not jumping on just a herniation or a cerebellar compression. So our patients will typically have a three Tesla MRI workup, a full study from what we would say is nose to tail, I don't know what you would call it, um, <clears throat> a CT scan uh, with a three-dimensional reconstruction. They'll have a brain auditory evoked, a hearing test on a medical infrared imaging and radiographs, and that generates quite a bit of data, and as we found, it makes a big difference in our patients, and those that were referred to me uh, where things were overlooked. <clears throat> the second condition mentioned is primary secretory otitis media, which really is terrible terminology on the veterinary side. It seems to be a condition that's analogous to OME, or otitis media with effusion, that is in your world. And one of the questions I have is, we see it, and you'll see in the data quite commonly, yet having attended these conferences for almost a decade, I've never heard it brought up in a Chiari conference. And the signs are quite similar to patients with Chiari malformation. So we have this other condition, which is you'll learn about in a second, is a mucus accumulation in the middle ear, but the signs mirror Chiari malformation in our patients. And uh, if you recollect in the canine world, the most common sign we see is cranial facial caritis or scratching. Um, so moving ahead, <clears throat> you know, we started looking at instability. It was based on uh, Fraser's presentation probably five or six years ago, and we went back and looked at our our data sets and found quite a bit beyond just the cerebellar compression. We found patients that had uh, dorsal compressions at C12. Uh, inexplicably, we found medullary kink or ventral compression of the cervical medullary uh, junction, and uh, we had no idea what consequence it was until we started seeing these presentations. Um, we use the term AOO for basilar impression or basilar invagination, so that term will come up, but this is cerebellar compression. In our world, it was originally just quantified as mild, moderate, and severe, which meant if you spoke between surgeons, you had no idea what the other person was seeing. Someone else is mild. Even within my own hospital, my neurosurgeons would call mild, and this one's calling it moderate, so it really didn't help us communicate. And we made an effort to calculate <coughs> indices based on MRIs so that we could all have a, a number to talk about, a relative number, uh, one of the oddities, and uh, it may not be true in your world, that my patients vary from um, half pound to 30 pounds. Chiari malformation, we haven't recognized in any patient over 30 pounds yet in 10 years. We've seen it in four cats, but it's mostly a disease of small breed dogs and a handful of cats. Uh, but most of my patients will range between one half pound and 30 pounds, but there's quite a size difference in that range. So we came up with indices or relative levels of compression based on the neurostructures being evaluated. So here's a dorsal compression index looking at this C23 dorsal compression of the spinal cord and subsequent syringomyelia. <clears throat> this is medullary kink, um, and we don't use these angles that you all calculate. At least it's not prevalent in our world. We are struggling with coming up how to objectify medullary kink or these, these ventral compressions. And some of them can be quite severe. The, the imaging we found most valuable is a, a CAT scan with three-dimensional reconstruction. And in going back and looking at these patients, a standard, what we call straightforward Chiari patient, will have a very broad-based compression in the cerebellar region, seen here. And when you look at the 3D reconstruction, the position of C1 relative uh, to the caudal fossa is pretty normal when you compare it to a dog without a compression. So that, that indentation is something other than C1. It's a malformation in the, what we call the caudal occipital region or the suboccipital region. When you look at the compression seen on patients with basilar invagination, it tends to be more linear. And, and when you look at the compression index, the data coming up, you'll find it's much more severe in compression. You look down here, you can see, there it is, the position of C1 residing in the caudal fossa. So for us, when we're trying to separate out basilar invagination, I, I asked someone at lunch, I forgot already, uh, you know, we use three-dimensional CAT scan reconstructions to try to pick this up. It's, it's not a measurement, but it, it does make it pretty obvious, at least on these imaging, where C1 is and where it's not supposed to be. Um, this diagram just depicts what we think is what's going on with the several levels of malarticulation. 
the, the occipital condyles malarticulating with C1, C1 malarticulating with C2, the dens deviating uh, dorsally. So we see any and all of these combinations occurring in our patients. Um, and when you're in there surgically, you can watch it happen as you change position. Uh, one of the presenters was talking about pushing down on a patient and watching the hypermobility. In surgery, we watch that too. We push down and watch everything moving in every direction it shouldn't be. Uh, so we suspected there was instability, but really didn't put our finger on it until you all helped us out. So we looked at the large number of dogs we saw. We found this, this compression, this, the, the uh, medullary junction at about 68% of patients in various degrees of severity. We also found this dorsal compression in about a third of patients. Um, and we looked at the basal invagination, this linear type compression, found it in a third of patients. And that seemed to be pretty relevant, um, that last number, the 27.7% with the basal invagination. That whole, con that whole subset of dogs was completely overlooked and no stability was provided in the first almost dec decade of dealing with this disease. We simply missed it, didn't see it, did a standard frame of magnum decompression, never addressed it, and those patients deteriorated. When you went back and found, followed these patients out, they didn't do too well. So lesson one was don't ignore some of, the more, some of the more obvious signs you can see. So we looked at some statistics to try to figure out what was going on with this. Uh, where, was it a breed scenario? You know, Chiari, uh, Chiari malformation seems to be very common in the Cavalier King Charles Spaniel with about 80% of the dogs having it. So 80, when you do studies of, quote, normal dogs, 80% of dogs will have a form of Chiari malformation present. Not all are symptomatic. Uh, when you look at the other breeds, the other small breeds, it's much less, far less. When I look at my population of dogs, we operate about 40% of non-cavaliers, which means they're experiencing some form of basal invagination. And that was borne out in this data. So when we looked at it, uh, we looked at breed, we looked at the type or level of compression, we looked at the other levels of instability, we found that AOO, the basal invagination, was most often associated with non-cavaliers. We looked at logistic regression to see if these things had any association, any interplay with each other. Um, and again, we found that the non-cavaliers uh, were more closely associated with that uh, basal invagination. So we, every time we collect this data, we're meeting with the statisticians, they're really encouraging us to separate them out. What's going on in the cavalier doesn't seem to be going on in the non-cavalier, even though they're all clustered as Chiari patients. So breed for us is going to be a significant thing. And we carve up all of our data now, segregate it into being cavaliers, non-cavaliers, and then we analyze it together to see if it makes a difference. So none of the abnormalities individually or collectively were associated with clinical signs as they stood alone or, like I said, in combination. The only variable that seemed to be associated with clinical signs was, um, or I should say syringomyelia, was the dorsal compression. We don't have a real answer for that. And syringomyelia was the only uh, abnormality associated with clinical signs. So you can have some level of imperfection on your, your MRI, but didn't necessarily translate to clinical signs unless it formed the syrinx. And the location of the syrinx didn't matter, but we still consistently now over 500 patients have never seen a syringomyelia patient form a syrinx midstream, mid in the thoracic region. It always starts cervical, goes thoracic, goes lumbar. We have never seen a syringomyelia patient associated with cranial cervical junction abnormalities, I should specify, forming a lumbar syrinx without first forming a cervical, thoracic, and then progressive process. These are some operative pictures just to show you what we deal with. Um, this is a patient that was about one pound, and you can see on the CT scan the level of instability we're dealing with, and uh, I don't know if you all would do measurements on something like that, but that's not unusual. This is pretty typical of what we're seeing a, a one pound patient, that level of distortion. So these patients are ventrally stabilized, decompressing this region, then we roll them over and go in dorsally and do the Chiari surgery, the frame and magnum decompression with the cranioplasty. So it ends up being, for us, about a two-hour surgery with about a half-hour prep time in between. This is a ventral approach. Um, and you can see C1 is here. The head is in this region. C1, and you got C2 with the dens. And you can see we put some traction to reduce the dens. We don't remove the dens. We just reduce C1 and C2, and then we stabilize. And we also remove articular cartilage and place a small graft. There's your dens there. So stabilization involves placing 1.5 millimeter titanium self-tapping screws. We put four in C1 and we put four in C2. 
and we use some thacrylate. And in between this, we'll burr off the articular cartilage on both sides and place a bone graft. Once that's accomplished, we roll over and do the frame of magnum decompression. And we still use the cranioplasty, the mesh applied to protect against scar tissue formation, which with this technique, we've almost eliminated. I mean, earlier on, I used to present, we had about a 25% scar tissue formation rate. And it's been seven or eight years we haven't seen a patient form scar tissue. It's almost, it's virtually eliminated. So postoperatively, our patient will go from this type of distortion to this type on a CT reconstruction. You can see the cranioplasty plate. You can see the ventral screws placed. Maybe this was a little long. Um, and then radiographically, this is what it looks like. Now, I went back and looked at the dogs where this went unrecognized or recognized, but no one knew what to do. And we just did the uh, frame of magnum decompression dorsally. They slowly deteriorated over a year. They improved and then progressively deteriorated. And if you watch the serial MRIs, this then slowly pokes up and eventually just de de uh, decompensates, the patient decompensates. So you can see progressive de uh, dorsal deviation each year as it climbs up. This is just a reminder that there's two surgeons, Dr. Catherine Lowen and I do all patients together, so it is a two-surgeon job, which in veterinary medicine is unusual. There's only two, two surgeries I do with two surgeons. One is a hip replacement and the other is brain surgery. So, and most of my patients, like I said, are quite small. Uh, the owners are quite small too, so <laughs> this is a, <coughs> both owner and patient are tiny when compared to me, and uh, that's a typical patient we'll see, and because of HIPAA, I'll just block them out there so you don't <laughs> <laughs> Nice little Italian lady. <laughs> she said, I like you very much. She said, I kill you if something goes wrong. And I, and I just laughed, and she said, no, I kill you. <laughs> okay, <laughs> little pressure. <clears throat> so a substantial percentage of dogs uh, that we have a Chiari malformation, also have a level of instability, basal invagination specifically. Um, and using these indices and objectifying the MRI may help us identify these patients in the hopes of addressing both conditions at the same surgery to prevent this failed Chiari surgery uh, myth that seems to be per uh, perpetuated. The existence of syringomyelia in any patient in our, in our hands uh, is relative to clinical signs or associated with clinical signs, I should say. So the other condition we see in conjunction with Chiari patients, a uh, pretty large number, is this primary secretorial otitis media, which at the end I have to hear more about in your world. No one <clears throat> does much with it, and the veterinary side, it's not a glamorous disease to research. It's really in the hands of the dermatologist. <clears throat> I went to the dermatology conference having sat in this group and said, why can't we get the word out to the pediatricians to send the patients to be evaluated? I thought, well, most of my patients are at the dermatologist's office for scratching. So I marched myself in there with a lecture entitled uh, the, uh, Chiari Malformation, the Scratching Dog, Only a Neurosurgeon Can Help. And they were intrigued by it uh, all the dermatologists. They came into the lecture and they were so amazed by that, this talk because they had called it uh, intractable allergic disease in, in Cavaliers. They came up with a new name and slapped it and it's the allergic Cavalier we can't stop from scratching. It's because they have Chiari Malformation. So they, uh, it caused a flood of cases, and they invited me to the World Dermatology Conference to do it all again. So it really got the word out there. This disease is a mucus accumulation uh, in the middle ear. The signs very much overlap with Chiari malformation. In, in our world, it's known as glue ear or PSOM. <clears throat> it seems to be analogous to OME based on what I've read about it. On otoscopic exam, you might, might look a little bit like this with a tympanum that's no longer clear, and you can see the mucus below. Most of these patients will be diagnosed on CT or MRI advanced imaging in conjunction with getting uh, imaging for Chiari malformation. The clinical signs of PSOM mirror Chiari. We get puritis, we get uh, hearing loss, we get head tilt. Ataxia, not so much. That's more of a Chiari sign. And we get some level of nystagmus if it's advanced. This is what we call air guitar. I actually studied tapes of dogs scratching. And if you watch closely, the Chiari dog rarely makes contact. He does what we call an air guitar. Waves his paw, but if he makes contact, he screams, so he knows not to do it. He just kind of goes like this. Whereas the PSOM dog actually digs his foot in his ear and starts. And it took a couple hundred scratch and dog videos to figure out there's a different scratch between dogs. So we suspect that we can maybe separate this out in a clinical evaluation too. <clears throat> Again, no one's done a lot of research on the veterinary side. We know that, that this, this is either a problem with clearance of mucus or I suspect it's a pressure imbalance. 
that the Chiari patients uh, seem to have a higher prevalence of this condition, that there may be some level of pharyngeal slouching. The staking tube is no longer maintaining the pressure uh, balance between the middle ear and the mouth of the out external environment, and that you're getting an accumulation of mucus for that reason. So I wonder if this has to do with pharyngeal slouching and that stenting the staking tube may be the way to handle this. So we mentioned otoscopy, radiography. <clears throat> CT scan is the more traditional. You can see here the bulla filled with mucus, and on MRI they light up quite nicely. These are supposed to be air-filled chambers. We read an original paper we wrote on this, uh, was trying to figure out is CT or MRI the way to do it, uh, the way to diagnose it. The treatment is fairly, because we don't understand how it's happening or why it's forming, the treatment is fairly rudimentary. It's a myringotomy with a flush, um, which really isn't the answer, but it's the only treatment reported in the literature. And if you look at it, the mucus comes out almost in one grab. In this case, it didn't, but it's got that type of consistency. You reach in, you grab it, and the whole plug will come out in one shot. Right after lunch, it was the perfect time. <laughs> I told them I should have gone earlier. So we look at our dogs. Of the Chiari patients, almost a third of them, or over a third of them, had this PSOM condition. Um, and many of them were asymptomatic. Some were clinical, as we understand, because there's a lot of overlap if you're clinical for PSOM or Chiari. We looked at the breed, the, the Cavaliers. Again, something special about them. They seem to be experiencing PSOM more frequently than the non-Cavaliers do. And the non-Cavaliers, if you remember, had more of the basal invagination, whereas the Cavaliers had more of the Chiari malformation. So there may be some association there. We looked at CT versus MRI. And this is the exact same patient. You can see the CT scan, which was the traditional method of diagnosing it, really isn't uh, comparable to an MRI. So we found the sensitivity and the specificity difference, and MRI is superior than CT scan for diagnosing this condition. <clears throat> we looked at the treatment, which is, is fairly rudimentary, doing these flushes. The average patient took up to four times. We follow them out. The average patient took four myringotomies before they cleared the condition, and that's what that looks like here. On a two-year follow-up, 85% took four treatments. So our conclusions were that 37% of dogs with Chiari malformation also have PSOM yet I never hear you guys talking about it. So. Um, and that this flushing treatment takes multiple treatments to get resolution. And it's probably not the ideal way to treat it, but uh, until we have something better, that's what's being done. And <clears throat> I get to do this talking, but there's a group behind me, and they deserve credit to everybody from statisticians to radiologists to neurologists and neurosurgeons all play a role in presenting the data. So I thank them too. And that's all I have for you. Question. In the, in the MRI that you do as a worker, do you do a venography as well? Because uh, the otitis media may actually be a cause of thrombosis of the sinus. See, uh, in the past, uh, uh, tumor cerebral, which may be associated with Chiari, was thought to be otitic hydrocephalus because of the unrecognized thrombosis of the sinus. So maybe this is a similar phenomenon. The otitis is present, and then there is a obstruction temporary since it appears to take several months to resolve. You say the, otitis specifically, otitis. Otitis. <coughs> otitis. When, we, when we look at that mucus, it's non-inflammatory. So that's why I asked the, the original mm -hmm. term, primary secretory otitis media. I have a, another mm -hmm. slide where it, it's not a primary, mm -hmm. it's not an otitis, um, it's not secretory. It, it is in the middle ear, so that's the one term I agreed with. And mm -hmm. uh, it was for the dermatologist who labeled it this, this term that makes no sense. So I don't know if that's, we don't do vascular workups on it. Okay. And we don't know the mechanism yet. Okay, thank you. Hearing loss is very common. We, we, have to, we have 400 patients we're going to go through the hearing loss, but are they deaf from the PSOM or diminished hearing? Um, and it's substantial. But some of our Chiari patients have diminished hearing too, inexplicably, not associated with it. So we're trying to separate that out. Um, what goes on with the eustachian tube drainage? Because I think if you look at the Chiari patients in general, there's a little bit of a greater incidence of a history of meringotomy tubes, recurrent otitis, and sinus problems. I've always attributed it to a hypoplastic skull base, kind of with small ostea and small eustachian tubes. Uh, 
in these dogs, do they have obliteration of the tubes or? They're, they're frequently occluded. And my yeah. question is, is the tube really a, a, a pathway for drainage of this thick, ropey mucus? That, I, I don't well, maybe see it that just crap. builds up because it's not draining, it's you know. There. Yeah. That's right. true. We, we're, we're playing with that concept because we thought if we can stent the tube, I now do a lot of interventional radiology, so they got me into stenting. We're thinking about stenting these stake tubes mm -hmm. and see if that helps. That's the... Thank right. you.